Today we continue our journey in the book of Mark concerning the, the life and ministry of Jesus. And um, last, last week I, I spoke a message uh, concerning the, the Pharisees and, and the Herodians and how they uh, conspired to trap Jesus in his words. And um, they, they wanted an excuse actually to have him put to death. And Jesus, he uh, answered their trapping questions very wisely, explaining them to them the proper perspective on how God wishes his children to view government and how he wants them to submit, first of all, to God, but also to, to know how to deal with government. And uh, the religious leaders, they thought they had them. Uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they were trying to turn the people against Jesus. And they thought that uh, they could drop this bomb on him and, uh, and that it would actually damage his reputation before the, uh, the people. And amongst these, um, these religious leaders that uh, were present, there were... Um, Sadducees. Now, there's a lot, probably a lot, a lot more talk about the error of the Pharisees, and um, we don't necessarily know a lot about the Sadducees. And uh, I'm getting a lot of ringing here, Steve. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe I could get you to shut this mic off right here. Is that better? Yep, that was it. Perfect. So the Sadducees, they, they had a different view of God than that of the Pharisees. And um, you see, the, the Sadducees, they understood something about Jesus because they had been following him and they'd been listening to what he had to say and not, not from a, a heart of gratitude or uh, wanting to hear uh, the truth from what he was saying, but they, they were following him with great interest because they considered Jesus to be a threat to them and to what they wanted. And uh, one of the things that, that they, they heard from Jesus' lips as he was teaching, and, and this is right, this is after the, the, most of the ministry of Jesus was completed before his crucifixion, they understood that Jesus supported the view that there's life after death. And uh, the Sadducees, they, um, they actually didn't believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection. Um, they didn't also believe in angels or spirits. In their opinion, once you were dead, you went to sleep. You were six feet under, and that was it. And this sect of Judaism was, I guess, you would call them the secularists. And um, it was comprised, the Sadducees' um, faction was co comprised of very educated men and people that held very prominent positions in, uh, in the society that they had. Um, they were, you know, the ones that supported Herod, they were... They pretty much ran things in the temple. So they, had, they held power, great power and authority over the Jewish people. And one of the things that Jesus pointed out was that they looked at things as, um, uh, what can we get out of this deal? How can we serve ourselves so that we have prominence, so that we can live in comfort. They actually turned the Jewish religion away from uh, spiritual reality into a money-making scheme. And in this scenario, we, we see that just before this, and I had mentioned this the last couple of weeks, that these Sadducees were the ones that were responsible for the marketing that was going on 
in the temple. And, and we see how Jesus responded to that by actually going to the tables, the table of the tables of the money changers and flipping over the tables and, and saying, get out of here. You guys are turning God's place of prayer into a house of robbers, a den of thieves. So the Sadducees, they, uh, they're like, huh? Who are you? They had an axe to grind against Jesus for shaming and criticizing the system that they had set up and that they were comfortable in. See, G Jesus was threatening their power structure and, and actually their, their posh way of living. They had honor amongst the people. They had flowing robes and, and people bowed to them. And at special banquets and occasions, they had the head table. It was all about power and control and money to these men. They're skeptical and secular. And, and they represented, I guess they, you could say they represent a, seg a segment of, of society that we live amongst today. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are skeptics. And they're all about their religion for power and control. And actually for money. So this isn't a new idea. You know, from the teachings of Jesus that had led up to this point here. Um, and he, Jesus supported the idea that life as we know it isn't just about the here and now. There's more to it than that. It's not just about how we can make things better in our physical existence right now. But life continues after death. The Sadducees knew that Jesus had taught about this, and they wanted to use that as a point to try and destroy Jesus. In the text we look at today, we, we see how this objective of the Sadducees was to poke fun at Jesus and try to make him look foolish before the people. And by doing so, they would benefit because what Jesus did in the temple could be shown to be off track. And they could maintain their influence and power over society. So we read in Mark 12, which is our text today, starting with verse 18 to 27. We'll start with verse 18. Mark chapter 12, verse 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up the offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Since the seven were married to her. Hmm. So, here's the Sadducees' trap that they're setting for Jesus. You know, they knew that in Jewish custom, and Jewish law... They didn't have a social safety net back then. You couldn't just, you know, collect, you know, you were left destitute from the government. If you were a widow, um, you were left destitute and try, to try and make it by yourself. So in the law of Moses, they had a provision. So for if, if, if a family of people was there and, and a lady who was married to one of the bro brothers died, well then it would be the responsibility of the other brother to come and, and make uh, and marry that person to continue and try and, and provide uh, shelter for them, um, children for them, so that they would have a future. And so they knew this was the, the setting. And they presented Jesus with this crazy scenario. And they... <laughs> What they were attempting to do is to, to make Jesus look foolish 
And, and they wanted to demonstrate the absurdity of the resurrection in their mind. And their assumption, actually, when you read this here, their assumption is that uh, they believe that those who thought the resurrection was a real thing, namely the Pharisees, who they hated, um, they believed that uh, life would continue on in their human relationships just the same as they are in this present life. And uh, I'm sure they heard Jesus talk about the resurrection and about life after death in his teachings, and they thought, aha, this is where we're going to plan our attack on him. So they painted this scenario that seemed to be impossible to, uh, to deal with. So Jesus, in response to what they, they said here, he, he confronts the Sadducees, and he confronts them with two levels of possibility. And Jesus replied in verse 24, Are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures? Or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So the Sadducees, the Sadducees were the liberals of their time. They were willing to reinterpret doctrines or the passages of the Old Testament scriptures that they had in their possession to fit in with a, a more modern viewpoint, I guess you could say. But Jesus is telling them here that they're in error in their thinking either because they don't know what the scriptures say or they actually don't know the power of God. Now, for the most part, I think these Sadducees, it's fair to say, they were aware of the Old Testament. Most of them had studied the Old Testament in their youth and they had come to some conclusions about that. They studied in the same way that the Pharisees would have studied, yet their interpretation of what they read and the conclusions they came to were very different. And when you read the Bible from cover to cover, when you look at the Old Testament, you ask yourself, is there any evidence for teaching in the Old Testament of the resurrection of the dead? Well, it doesn't talk a lot about that. The Old Testament you know, talks an awful lot about present day living, but... If you look at it, there's absolutely no doubt that um, there is evidence in the teachings of Scripture that there is life after death. Absolutely no doubt. So, for instance, um, in the book of Genesis, we're told about one of the original men who walked closely with God. You, you guys may have heard of him. His name is Enoch. Well, in Enoch's case, he was taken alive from this life because God saw how, how holy he walked with him. And God decided to take him before his death. Genesis 5.24 is written, Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more, because God took him away. Now likewise, there's another person in Scripture that was taken from the earth prior to a physical death, and that person was Elijah. In Elijah's case, the Scriptures tell us that he was, God came down with chariots of fire and took Elijah away while Elisha, his young apprentice, was watching. And the chariots of God came and took Elisha, Elijah. He never died. God took him to be with him. The prophet Daniel is very clear in 
Daniel chapter 12 too. He says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Is that pretty clear? That God's saying through his word that there is an afterlife? That there's life after death? I think so. And I, I don't think many of those Sadducees were uh, saying, well, that's not Scripture. Job, Isaiah, I could go on and on and on about this. Job, Isaiah, David also spoke very directly and very clearly about a person's life after death. And the Sadducees, they, they didn't come to terms with this or they didn't want want to come to terms with the literal conclusions of these passages. Now, I, would just, I guess you could say that the Sadducees were anti-supernaturals. The Old Testament is filled with references to God's supernatural intervention. The whole exodus of the people of Israel was supernatural. The waves standing up on edge, making a way for the children of Israel to escape the clutches of the Egyptian army. That was supernatural. It's not, you, know, you, you read some texts, some liberal texts that talk about this and goes, yeah, you know, the earth's axis was on a certain angle and there was a, you know, the moon was lined up with all the planets at the same time and, you know, it caused the tide to shift and, and it spread this sea open and they happened to walk through at this time. No. Moses struck the water with his staff and it went poof. That is not natural. You can't explain that one away. You know, Jesus coming to this place here. You know, these Sadducees, they were very much aware of Lazarus. The story was everywhere. Jesus, before he approached Jerusalem, he said to Lazarus, after four days in the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus rose from the dead and he came out wearing his grave clothes. And here these Sadducees are holding their liberal viewpoint that the supernatural somehow can be explained away by some other things. They ultimately, they didn't believe in the power of God to be able to do things like this. Jesus brings up this point. He says, consider the burning bush, you guys. You know, when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, that's a mirac miraculous event, first of all. And second of all, when he identifies himself to Moses who is the patriarch that they held to in their liberal interpretation of his teachings, which were for the benefit of society and the good, good things that it brought to society. That's what they viewed it as, as a good teachings. Does that sound familiar? The Bible is comprised of these good teachings that you sort of pick and choose, and it's really good for your society, but you can't really believe the stories in there for what they are. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So Jesus is like, he identifies himself to Moses and he says, I'm the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, where were I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They were long gone before Moses. God didn't say I'm the God of the dead. He's saying he's the God of the living. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were very much alive and we're with him on the other side. The Sadducees' secular approach to the Scriptures was simply that the Scriptures provide good moral guidelines that help society. But God isn't the God of the dead. He's the God of the alive. Either the Bible is true or the Bible isn't. You know, it's part of our fallen nature to doubt the Word of God. Why? Because who whispers in our ear, did God really say? Who whispers that? 
Satan. He's always been there whispering that into the ears of human beings. Did God really say this? Gets us to question it. Well, I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe that's just an interpretation that you have of what he said. You know? For the present liberal Christian that fits into this kind of way of thinking, the earth eh, wasn't really actually created in six days because in their minds that's simply impossible. It has to be some other explanation. Is God really powerful enough simply to speak things into existence? Is he big enough to say, let there be light and there was light? Or does there have to be some explanation? Is it, is it the same as the explanation in the liberal commentaries that you see about the, the parting of the Red Sea being a result of the lunar lineup with all the planets and the pull of gravitational forces and it happened to be the right season and a certain tide and all this stuff? That's, what that's the way this mindset is. Is God really big enough to do what he says? From everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Jesus is saying to these guys, you guys, you either don't know what the scripture says or you doubt the power of God. Is, is God, is Jesus really the only way to eternal life? Even if you believe, if you believe in his if you believe in life after death, I was talking to someone the other day. Oh, I believe there's something. I believe there's something. I feel sorry for him. I started talking to him about it. I believe something. I just don't know what it is. Maybe this is right. Maybe that's right. Maybe you're right. You know, God is alive and he's real. And because he's alive and he's real, there is a right way and there is a wrong way. There's a way that seems right into a man, but it leads into death therein. We can, can be convinced of so many lies that are passed off as the truth. Did God really say? Well, what does the Bible say? Is Jesus the only way to God, as the Bible says? Or is this view too narrow? And is he just one way of many ways to this divine presence somewhere out there? You know, this mindset. Is it really a sin for me to move in with my girlfriend prior to being married? Is it really a sin for me to swap spouses when the Bible directly speaks clearly to these acts as being wrong? You see where I'm going with this? If you open the doorway to a liberal interpretation of the Bible, absolutely everything is possible. You will, you will justify everything away that doesn't agree with something that you want to hold to. There's some things in the Bible, my friends, that make us feel uncomfortable. God calls some things wrong. And in the scriptures, we see the fall of mankind brought people to the place where they did everything that they thought was right in their own eyes. And look, our society, the way it is, the brokenness, the brokenness, the cries of the people at night, where their lives are shattered. Children crying because they don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn because everything's so broken. So much brokenness. Why is this? Because everybody has sought to do what is right in their own eyes. Not realizing that the God of the scriptures, the living God who created the heavens and the earth, has a template for us because he loves us and he wants us to obey him even when we don't see that it is making us feel comfortable. Because he knows what's best. He loves us. Jesus is speaking to this. The question is ultimately this. Should the Bible be taken literally or not? The Sadducees would say probably not. And what does Jesus say to them here? He says, you do not understand the power of God. You are badly 
emphasis on badly mistaken. And Jesus proves the resurrection of the dead. And how does he prove it? You know what he does? He points to the Bible. He points to the Bible. He says, this is what the Scriptures say. God uses the present tense, declaring that God is, is, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is where Jesus goes to. He, wrote, he could have said, you know, like, what are you guys talking about? Did, weren't you at... Weren't you there or didn't you hear about the miracle that I performed in calling Lazarus out of the grave? He could have done that, but he's, he chose to go to the Old Testament and point something out to them. You see, so then as believers in any age, and in this age that we live in, where the philosophy of the Sadducees is still very much alive and well, the skeptics are abundant out there. And they ask the question, did God really say? And who's whispering in their ear? Did God really say? How can we stand on God's word against these waves of liberalism in, in theology which undermine it? And it's very simple. The answer is very simple. Believe. Believe. Say, Lord, I choose to trust in you. If you remember this one question, you will never fall into Satan's trap of did God really say. You'll not be swept by the waves of cultural force that are pushing you to, to believe something or to question something that God says very clearly in his word. What does the Bible say? That's the question. What does the Bible say? And it's really that simple, my friends. If we ask that question in every scenario that we're in, what does the Bible say about this? It will solve every modern controversy that approaches the church. Every single one can be answered when we enter that realm and we say, what does the Bible say? I choose to believe God. I choose to let go of my doubts. Because it's not natural, my friends, to believe in the parting of a Red Sea. In a, it's not natural. It's supernatural. If you want to approach God, you must approach him by faith, by believing that he is, and by believing that he is involved in this world. And he loves you so much. He loves you so much. But you must come to him by faith and belief. Whenever you're trying to decide something to do, how you should do it, what does the Bible say? When you listen to someone's sermon like mine, or you listen to some sermon online or some other minister's sermons, you should be asking the question, what does the Bible say? Is what Pastor Quint is saying line up with the Bible? And if it doesn't, God forbid, I need to be corrected. I need to be in line with this. I need to be asking when I'm making, and I, I pray that I do, when I'm making my messages for you to give you the bread of life that God's given. That's my job, is to feed the flock as Christ feeds me and, and to feed one another. That's my, my particular spiritual gift. Everyone's got spiritual gifts. That's mine. And I have to be asking, is what I'm saying true? Is what I'm saying in line with the word of God? And I pray that it is. But you should be evaluating that. Don't just blindly hear what I'm saying or what anyone else says. Ask, does the Bible say this? Evaluate it on that basis. This question will help you navigate. And you know what? Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. God loves us so much, he gives us answers. And there is real answers out there. Reasonable answers. 
Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, God, for your revelation in your word in the Old Testament. So, in our text this morning, the Sadducees asked Jesus this mocking question to make their point. Can God, can God raise the dead? That's what they're asking. In other words, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to say, well, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? They're asking a question like that. The assumption that the, the Sadducees had was that, um, that people in heaven, according to the Pharisees' teaching, would very much travel along life like they travel along here in the earth. But Jesus says, this is the wrong approach, guys. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because, the Bible says, because the Word of God says that it's wrong. If you look at the totality of the Scriptures, they had the wrong idea about the resurrection. You see, Jesus says that people, when they come back to life, his children, those that are his children, when they come back to life, they're going to be like the angels in heaven. It doesn't mean we're going to be exactly the same, but there are going to be similarities between us in our resurrected body and in our resurrected life and that of the angels right now. And in this passage, those similarities are that there's not going to be any marriage in heaven like there is here on the earth. The fact that there's not going to be marriage in heaven implies at least two other things. First of all, there's not going to be any procreation in heaven. The number of the redeemed saints of God called into his holy presence is set. There's a certain number of people, and when that number of people is met, the end will come, and God will bring everything into a new order. The old order of things will be passed away. So, with no death, it's everlasting life. I had a, well, I had a trip between Williams Lake and here that was really revealing to me. I shared it a little bit with my Bible study group, and I was going to share it with the men at the fishing retreat, but it just, I started off in Williams Lake with a car that needed some gas. You know, it's so expensive for gas now, right? You guys know this. Um, I fixed a little car up for my son, for my youngest son. And it's a little old car, but it gets great gas mileage. And I ha I've got this thing on the road, and I'm teaching him how to drive standard, and he's going to get this car. But I'm test driving it, and as a matter of fact, I'm liking the fuel economy a lot better than my Chev 2500. So I'm in Williams Lake in this car, and I need to fuel up. So I'm looking for the best gas price, and it's at Super Save, by the way. $1.97.9, if you go to the pump. Cheaper than what it announces on the board. That's great. Well, I filled it up, and I thought, I'm really curious as to how good this gas mileage is. So I reset it, reset my odometer to zero. And, and I started to drive from zero from Super Save gas, and I started thinking, well, I'm going directly to the church. Well, how far is that anyways? Man, that's about 90 kilometers. And that's just like, God hit me between the eyes with this whole thought. That's like, that's like the years of your life, every kilometer. You're, if you live to 90 years old, or just over 90 years old, that's a full life. Pretty good life. Some people live to 100 or just over 100, but not a whole lot more than that. And I started to remember the mileposts of my life journey. I remember back to when I was four years of age. My parents had recently become Christians, coming out of a very bad environment. Both of them came from alcoholic, abusive homes. They both got saved, became Christians. God transformed their lives. 
And I was born into the, I was about three years old when that happened. And when I was four years of age, my mother sat me on her knee. And that's one of my memories that I have. My mom sitting her on, sitting me on her knee and telling me about Jesus. I don't remember exactly what she says, but she asked me if I wanted to make Jesus my savior. And I remember saying yes. And I remember praying at the age of four. I don't remember much about my four year, my fourth year, but I remember that. And I start, I hit that point just outside of Williams Lake. Then we go to the next stage. I can remember. Yeah, we moved from 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 Blue. We moved from Kamloops to Clinton, and I lived in Clinton. I started to remember my school life and the things that happened to me—the good and the bad and the ugly and everything in between—and and everything rolled out. It was just like a time chart as I began to drive towards Hundred Mile. You know, I reached I reached 150 Mile, and I'm graduating from high school, and I. I'm just down the road, I'm, I'm married, and just down the road from there at Knife Creek, I have my first child with my wife. And we moved from you know, where we were in Victoria to, to Fraser Lake, and on and on it went, all the way through. And it was just like God was revealing these things to me. And some of the things that I did in my life that I regretted, I remembered, and I wept inside. I'm like, God, that was... And he's like, don't you see? Yesterday is history. And history is miles away. But I've pointed out these mileposts for you, my son, so that you can take note, remember my faithfulness, and remember the points at which you made errors. And entrust your life to me. And you know, I came to Canco Gas Station in Lackahash in my life, where I am right now. That's where I am. You are all on that same highway at different mileposts along the way. And God's reaching out to you. Life, there is life after death, my friends. I got to the church here and I'm thinking about retirement and I'm thinking, where are my parents? And where's my wife's parents? And, you know, my wife's mother is right at the church. She's not, she's turning 90. And I thought, she doesn't have a whole long journey left. I mean, it, none of us know. I mean, there could be someone that comes across the road and hits us, or a wild animal jumps out of the ditch and plows into us, or we have a mechanical failure in the car, and right away, we're in the presence of God, standing before him. But at most, your life and my life is like a drive from Williams Lake to the intersection of Highway 97 and Highway 24. Nobody goes past Highway 24 in this life. And when you get to that intersection, you either go left or you go right. Either you go on the wide path or you go on the narrow path that leads to life. Nobody escapes the clutches of the grave. Therefore, how we live our lives in this context is so, so important. You have very little time. And you know what what caught my attention so much is Yesterday seems like yes, a couple of days ago, but it's years ago. And the older you get, the, the quicker this seems to go. It's just a little time. So my counsel this morning is, don't be like the Sadducees who are full of skepticism, thinking that there's, never, there's nothing on the other side. Don't let that doubt, did God really say? No, there is. There is life on the other side of this life. And it's eternal life. And it goes into the horizon further than you can even imagine. Wow. This morning, I kind of deviated from what I intended to say on the end of this. I believe God wanted you to hear that. You see, what we see in the Bible and what we see exemplified in the church and even the lesson that I gave you there, an example, God is preparing a place for us who believe. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. That 
when I come again, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, when we get to the other side, it's going to be different. We're not going to have any memory of the horrible things that we've had to go through in this world, in this life. That's all going to be washed away. You're going to remember the ones that you love that are with you, for sure. But it's, the relationship's going to be different than what you have here. You're going to remember your spouse. You're going to know who they are. But your relationship's going to be completely different. There is going to be a completion in your spirit where the things that are vacant in your life now will be made full and complete in the arms of the Savior. You see, many people think that God almost was made for them to serve their purposes. The truth of the matter is, my friends, that God was not made by anyone, and he was certainly not made to serve my purposes. We were made to serve his purposes. We are made to bring glory to him. And this is why Jesus calls us his bride. You see, the relationship is going to be so different. What is vacant right here, our loneliness and our sorrow and the sin that encapsulates our society and the world, it's all going to be washed away. And it's going to be replaced with the everlasting glory of God. And that is very real. It's not just a story. It's not an allegory. Did God really say this? Yes, he says it. Throughout the scriptures, he says it. In John 3.29, we read, John 3 says, The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is in full joy when he hear the hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. When we get to the other side, the bride of Christ will be united to him. In other words, all those, those feelings of this isn't quite right. This isn't my home and I know it. It's not quite right no matter how good it is. It's still not quite right. Why? Because you were made for heaven. You were made for eternity. You were made to be at one with the Lord for everlasting eternity. And this is the hope that there is in Christ. There is reality in the living word of God. Jesus, the word made flesh who has come to us to show us the heart of God, says, he says this. John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. It's a lot of trouble stuff out there, isn't there? We go through a lot of trouble in this world. But Jesus calls out to you and he says, come to me. Let me take your burden it's just a little while, my child, and everything will be made new. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. And one day, I don't know where you are on your path between Williams Lake and Highway 24. I'm at Clancy's. Yeah, I don't know where you are. Maybe you're at 150 mile. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe you're uh, close to the church. Maybe you're past the church, heading into town. But one thing's for certain. You have very little time. In the time that you have, serve Jesus. And very soon, Revelation 19, 7 to 9 will become a reality. Where it is written. Let us rejoice and be glad 
and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. The righteousness of Christ has been given to you because of the work that Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Why? Because he lives. And in Revelation, chapter 19, verse 9, Then the angel said to me, Write this. What does God's word say? Right here. Pay attention. The angel said to John, write this. In other words, this is God's word, and it's his final word. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Amen. Would you pray with me today?